thanks for tuning in. My name is Rahul Banerjee from the Fred Hodgins and Cancer Center. And on behalf of my co-authors, it is uh, my privilege to prevent, to present this particular abstract today, The Impact of Dexamethasone Dose Strength on Outcomes in Newly Diagnosed Multiple Myeloma, a Secondary Analysis of SWOG Studies SO777 and S1211. This was abstract number 1066 at the recent uh, 2023 American Society of Hematology meeting, the ASH meeting in San Diego. And so as those of you listening to this uh, recording are well aware, dexamethasone, or dex as I'll call it, has been a mainstay of myeloma treatments for decades. Over 10 years ago, it actually was a cooperative group study, one of the ECOG studies that showed that dex dosing at 40 milligrams weekly was better than dex dosing even higher, which is what we had been doing in terms of uh, you know less mortality early on for patients with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. And since then, most trials have continued to use dex 40 milligrams-ish somewhere in that range. For example, these two very large SWOG cooperative group studies, SO777, which was comparing VRD or tezomeb lenalidomide dex versus lenalidomide dex, and S1211, which was comparing ELO-VRD, so elotuzumab or tezomeb lenalidomide dex versus VRD in high-risk patients. You see a schema here where it wasn't exactly 40, 40 milligrams weekly in every trial, but uh, very similar to it, maybe slightly higher actually. And so we all know that DEX has very real toxicities for our patients. You know, patients will tell you the toxicity that they readily notice with each dose. For example, insomnia, anxiety, edema, and more. Um, the figure on the bottom left here was a study uh, from the MSK group, Marathon that showed that even for patients who don't know that they're having insomnia with dexamethasone, you actually see with sleep uh, wearable activity monitoring that patients have significantly less sleep on these orange days or the dex days. Dex can cause visually significant cataract. This is work by our group in conjunction with the Health Tree Foundation showing that lifetime dexamethasone exposure, which is often measured in grams, terrifyingly enough, is associated with a higher risk of visually significant cataracts, for example, disruptive to patients' well-being, preventing them from driving, and so forth. And this applies even for dex dosed once a week, even if it's being dosed only periodically. And of course, polypharmacy, which means multiple oral medications can mean lower lenalidomide adherence. It means that you know, the more medications people are on, the less, uh, ab less ability they have to stay on every medication, every time point they have, even for some of these newer medications that might be more important. And there has been a study, there was a phase three randomized study done by Dr. LaRocca and, and her colleagues in uh, Italy that looked at patients who are older, had some degree of frailty, and looked at continuous lenalidomide and dex RD until progression, or lenalidomide and dex, but after nine months, the dexamethasone was stopped. You can see that the curves were kind of overlapping in terms of PFS, but there actually was potentially a, a, proved, a, a trend towards improved survival in the group that had less, less chronic dexamethasone. And so with that in mind, well, that was a study of RD, lanolidomide dex and frailer patients. We wondered in the era of triplet and quadruplet induction, how important is maintaining dex intensity, 40 milligrams weekly? Patients have many toxicities from it. In my clinical practice, we often dose reduce it entirely, if not stop it for patients who are having a response. Does this routine practice lead to worsened outcomes? And so what we looked at was in these in two large cooperative group studies, SO777 and S1211, we compared patients who had any type of dex dose reductions during induction versus those who maintained full dex dose intensity and hypothesized that the patients who had reduced dex dose in, in dosing would have comparable PFS and OMS. So what we did was this was a post hoc secondary analysis. We looked at all patients who completed induction across these two large studies. So these were US patients, newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. These were patients for whom immediate autologous stem cell transplantation was not planned. These patients were enrolled largely you know, beginning over a decade ago from April 2008 on through May 2016. So kind of older data, but on the flip side, we have much more robust follow-up. And we pooled data across arms and looked at, you know, based on demographics, myeloma characteristics, we looked at dex dose reductions for any reason between beginning dose to end of induction, tried to figure out why if we could. And then we uh, looked at PFS and OS, both landmark from the end of induction, which was about six months after patients registered. And so you can see here, these are clinical trial recipients. These are patients on clinical trials, where as all of you know, you know, physicians are often reluctant to change around their dosing unless the protocol allows it. And even then they're reluctant to do it. Even then, almost two thirds, more than two thirds of patients had dex dosing at the end of induction that was lower than their dex dosing when they started. This was applicable across all arms here. You can see more than half of patients in every single arm had their dex dose reduced over the course of induction. Unfortunately, we weren't really able to capture why. Um, for 84% of patients, it was unknown, but when a reason was listed, it was frequently an adverse event. 
You can see here, this was important because this is on a randomized analysis in this particular regard. We looked at patients who had full dose DEX, 168 patients, versus those who had reduced DEX during induction, 3 to 73 patients, and compared them in terms of baseline demographics. You can see there's no difference in age or performance status or ISS stage. Ironically, the reduced dex dose actually had a slightly higher proportion of patients with a high plasma cell burden in their bone marrow and were slightly more anemic than the other cohort. However, there were similar rates of off-study transplant usage. And interestingly, they did look at CRP, C-reactive protein, a measure of inflammation that was similar between the two arms. So this is the most important slide in my mind. You know, we often look for uh, two curves on a Kaplan-Meier plot to look different. Here, they look the same. So if you look at patients, of all patients who completed induction, there were no differences in PFS and OS among patients who had dose uh, reductions or dex versus those who didn't. You can see here, for example, median PFS on the left here was 34 months or 37 months. The P value was not significant. Here, dose reduced the uh, OS was 77 versus 92 months, but again, not statistically significant whatsoever. We did, as a form of a kind of a safety, kind of a guardrail, look at patients who had major dose reductions. Again, this was clinical trials. Uh, patients who enrolled on trials so very unlikely for them to have dose reductions in general. We looked at 40 patients. Only 7% of the cohort had major dose reduction. The DEX was either stopped entirely or dropped dramatically by over half. These patients were older, so over half of them were age 70 uh, uh, or older in this particular subset versus only 27% of the full dose group. Here, you did see a PFS drop off. So here, these patients who had major dose reductions of DEX, even on clinical trials, did have a median PFS of 20 for 37 months. That was statistically significant and a trend toward decreased overall survival. And so we looked at, you know, over 500 patients on two clinical trials. I think the big takeaway, kind of the biggest method I would have is that it is very common to reduce dexamethasone dosing. In real life, I do it all the time, even on clinical trials, or these are healthier patients, trial eligible, you know, the physicians might've been reluctant to lower their dosing. Over half of patients in every cohort and 66 per, more than 56% of patients overall did have a dex dose induction reducing. Overall, dex dose reductions were not associated with lower PFS or OS. Again, as a caveat there, we did look, uh, you know, pre-specified of this exploratory analysis here of patients who had their dex dosing dropped entirely or by over half. Those patients did have worse than PFS. However, only 40 patients, only 7% of the patients in our cohort, those patients were absolutely older than their cohort, than their counterparts who were younger and got full dose dex. And of course, the field has evolved in 2016. These studies accrued patients from 2008 eight to 2016, where, you know, probably less likely to have dex dose reductions happen. However, here, um, you know, in the modern era, we probably do have more patients with dexamethasone dosing dropped more routinely. With that in mind, prospective plan de-escalation of DEX is probably likely to benefit patients. Again, I brought up earlier the fact that these patients have, you know, issues with insomnia, definitely issues with cataracts, probably patients have issues with bone health and muscle health, so forth, with chronic dexamethasone. So there are probably some benefits from trying to de-escalate DEX. From this study, unlike pizza worse in PFS or OS, and most importantly, patients don't get extra credit for being maintained on full dose DEX. Even on clinical trials, patients are getting their DEX dose below what the protocol suggests as their starting dose, which suggests that our starting dose are probably too high. So our some limitations is analysis. Obviously, we weren't able to capture why DEX was reduced in the majority of our patients. There were missing variables. For example, such genetics we didn't have for the SWOG SO777 study. And technically, this was not applicable to patients who were transplant eligible. I do still think dexamethasone has an important role in cycle one. For example, pain control, rapid disease debulking, patients who are getting a monoclonal antibody, for example, you know, like daratumumab, ezetuximab, bilatuzumab. For those patients, you know, dexamethasone is often helpful to prevent allergic type reactions. However, beyond cycle one, I think we should talk about the modification of how this is dosed. For example, perhaps next 20 milligrams weekly should be the starting dose for all patients, not just aged over 75. For example, I think dexamethasone can and really should be considered to be stopped entirely or at least dose reduced after one to two cycles of induction. And there was, uh, not later this evening, but there was at the ASH meeting, a poster about a prospective study of ESA VRD doing exactly that, where the dex was stopped after two cycles of induction. So future studies are ongoing from our group, but in the interim, I'd like to thank all the patients who participated in these trials, all the investigators and study teams for SWOG SO777 and 1211, the SWOG group, the NCI, and the CRAB team from the statistics side were very instrumental to making this analysis happen. And of course, all the funding sponsors that allowed the trial to happen uh, um, in the beginning. 
So with that in mind, I'd like to thank you all for your time and for listening in. And I'm um, looking forward to continue the conversation by social media or by email and so forth. Thank you all again.